Hello Trailblazers, welcome to Ladakhini Island Developers Group. So today we're going to talk about preparing for admin certification and we'll deep dive into process automation topic. I'm Nishan Singh Pawar, the community group leader for Ladakhini Island Developers Group. I'm also an architect, developer and consultant working in Salesforce technology for the last seven years. You can follow me on Twitter at Nishan Force and check out my blog nishanforce.com for various content I write on Salesforce. I'm 13x certified trailer ranger and loves music. I play guitar for a hobby. If you are watching this on YouTube, please post your questions as comments and I'll try to answer them as soon as possible. Quick agenda for today, what we are gonna cover. So we'll talk about the community. Uh, we'll see uh, what are the various ways to link and connect to the community. We'll talk then about Salesforce admin certification. Initially, we'll start with the overview, overview of the exam for somebody new and then we'll also talk about the, what are the changes in the new syllabus from the previous one and then dive into the process automation topic see all the details go topic uh, by topic on the process automation uh, tools and then last we'll talk about uh, important tips uh, for exam and then we'll also share some resources which will be helpful while preparing for the admin certification now this is the very interesting slide forward looking statement you must have seen this uh, throughout uh, various sessions when you are attending when salesforce this is just generally talking about that if i uh, talk about any feature or any details which are forward looking which are going to happen in future so please don't make any purchasing decisions based on that information and only uh, do that based on the currently available or generally available features which are there in salesforce okay coming to community so this is uh, let any island developers group community which you are joining today and you can reach out to us on Twitter, Facebook. You can check out all our recordings on YouTube. Uh, to check for all the upcoming sessions we have, you can uh, check the link on bit.ly LKSF devs. So this link will take you to the community developer group page where you would see all the upcoming sessions. You can also connect to uh, the chatter group where we would be posting all the presentations and any uh, uh, resources or uh, content we have for the a Salesforce related topic, uh, Salesforce certification. So with that, I would start the session with a, a quick video, which will tell who is a Salesforce administrator. So let's understand who is a Salesforce administrator, and then we'll go into the details of how to get Salesforce admin certified and those things. What is a Salesforce administrator? Salesforce admins go by many names. They are productivity powerhouses, CRM rock stars, and Salesforce superheroes. They are your trusted advisors on all things Salesforce and a vital bridge between business and technology. So what exactly do they do? Salesforce admins can work on their own or as part of a team. They work alongside management to bring innovation to life, streamline processes, and keep the bottom line moving forward. Admins work hard to fight inefficiency and champion productivity. They probe the depths of the Salesforce ecosystem. They learn all of Salesforce's newest features and make sure every employee is up to speed. Salesforce admins are part advisor, part artist. They create awesome tools on any device, like easy to use dashboards, intelligent workflows, and apps for any project. And most importantly, they are there whenever you need them to keep your users educated, your problems solved, and your projects moving forward. A Salesforce admin delivers creative solutions, making your users happier and your business smarter. So next time you ask, what does a Salesforce admin do? Maybe you should ask, what don't they do? Learn more at admin.salesforce.com. Okay, so we saw like Salesforce administrator is not a single person. Uh, it's a person who plays a lot of major roles in the company, bridging the gap between the business and the technology, uh, giving very innovative solutions, solving the problems through various automation tools available in Salesforce and whatnot. So it Salesforce administrator is a role which does a lot of uh, uh, implementation and uh, uh, things which are uh, required for developing tools and things in place. So if we talk about the major core responsibilities of Salesforce administrator, these are the four uh, pillars of uh, 
roles which uh, I would put through and this is being said by Salesforce as well. So the first role comes is user management. So Salesforce admin need to uh, manage the users who are part of the uh, organization, like which user should get access to the org, which user should get what profile, what are their permissions, what they can do. So managing the users overall and the security of the org. So that's the first part. Second part comes is the data. So the data which sits in the CRM is uh, the source of truth, which gives you the insights about your company, which tells what company is doing, how it is performing, all the dashboards, everything depends on the data. So the data should be clean. So to manage and make sure the data is clean and good, uh, the role of admin comes in place to make sure there are some uh, duplicate management rules, validation rules, the data looks and sits good in CRM because that's the core of everything. Then comes security to make sure everything is uh, compliant. Uh, everyone should see what they should see and not see anything uh, additional to that and those kind of things. So you should make sure that the org is secure and you are not opening up or giving out your data, which is very precious for a company and keeping it intact. Then last comes is the reporting. So with all this data and security in place, you need to open that up and give some actionable reporting that how your org is behaving, how is the company growing, all those numbers and charts which uh, the leadership is looking for. So admins are the one who would prepare those uh, dashboards and reports and give out to the leaders <clears throat> to make some uh, insightful decisions how the company can grow more. Exam overview, so it's a 65 question exam uh, out of which uh, 60 questions would be scored and five questions would be uh, not scored. They would be just for improvement of the exam and the Salesforce team would be evaluating those uh, questions just for uh, uh, their uh, analysis and making the exam more better. And it, it will give you one hour 45 minutes to answer all these 65 questions. And you need to get 65% score to pass the exam. Uh, so probably it's around uh, 39 questions out of those 60 which will be scored but you don't know which are those five so i would say uh, keep a margin there of five more and then try to get at least 43 44 questions right out of all those 65 you would immediately get the result and you would also get the result with the a breakup so like the weightage of the exam it would have 13 percent this and then it would also tell you out of these 13 percent how much you scored so how was your percentage overall in this area and then you can uh, prep for it if you don't pass in the first attempt. Uh, then this is a closed book exam. It would be monitored. So you can give it on a proctored uh, uh, session or you can also go uh, in, in your online proctor way where you can set up a webcam or use your computer's uh, webcam and then give it in the room where somebody would be monitoring you uh, through the webcam. And it, uh, the exam fees is $200. And if you take a re-attempt, it would be half the price, $100. And then we'll come to the syllabus. So this was an old syllabus uh, with the old weightage. Uh, I have uh, put another slide to compare the old syllabus with new syllabus. So I'll just run through that. And these are some uh, focus topics which I, I used to share in all the sessions. So always I keep the Salesforce user setup and security as the first priority focus topic. Um, and uh, this is the 20% weightage of the exam, which was earlier and still now it is 20%, but now this uh, weightage has also included the organizational setup into it. So now all of these about three points come under this configuration and setup, which is 20% of exam. And I would keep this again, the first priority, uh, most important part, because this has the part of user setup and security. Organization setup is very basic, like company information, uh, currency. These are small things which you can just go read through, but uh, important part is to understand the user setup and security, which is 20%, which would be uh, focused for most of the uh, Salesforce certification exams. And you should understand this uh, through by heart and how Salesforce implements security. Then comes the second part, which is data management, reporting, and the automation. So these three topics, uh, earlier comprises of 28% of the weightage, which is now 30%, it has increased. And also you can see the process automation part, which today we are gonna cover is increased by twofold. It was 8% earlier, now it is 16% weightage. So it's a very important part now, part of the certification that you understand all these low code automation tool where you don't need to write a code and you can implement any business functionality logic required for, uh, for your company. So this is the second most important focus area to understand when you are uh, implementing and being part of as a Salesforce admin certification. Now, third part is the vanilla Salesforce. Basically this whole 
uh, section is a vanilla Salesforce, which comes out of the box. You should understand these things are there for you to use and leverage uh, before writing anything new. So the, there are sales marketing applications, service support applications. You have the standard objects. There is a relationship between them. You can create some custom objects though. Yeah, so understanding those things as well is very good. Then a little bit of Lightning App Builder has also come in the new syllabus, which is more for the App Builder certification. Things are now coming into this admin certification. Some uh, topics from there all, as well has come into uh, admin certification. So this is overall to understand out of the box Salesforce what is coming as a, a package. And then lastly, there were few uh, uh, few random topics. Uh, which are about Salesforce App Exchange, mobile, all those have been clubbed into productivity and collaboration uh, topic of 7%, which was the same as previously, almost same, and then it's kept. So this I would keep as a low hanging fruit, separate fourth priority, last priority, which you can just uh, read through and understand before your exam one week or two weeks before. Okay, so from that focus topics, let's bring that in a table. How does that overall looks like? So these are the five topics which are the focus topics um, from there. So user setup and security, 20% weightage, which we already covered. We have a session. So all these sessions previously, which we did are on YouTube. You can go to this link, bit.ly admin videos. It will open a playlist with all these existing videos. You can go through them. So, and then second session, which we did was on data management and reporting. So that data management reporting topic is uh, half some portion of this second focus area, which is 30% weightage. Uh, and today we'll cover the workflow automation. So we will now complete the 50% of our course uh, for Salesforce admin certification. And then we'll do another session for uh, covering the vanilla Salesforce objects. These are like, again, from this whole 43% whole, uh, uh, of the area, if you still just, uh, try to cover the 20% area, which is just talking about the uh, custom object app builder. I think that should also be enough to cover and we'll also cover some of the points from the standard uh, objects as well, which are related to process automation. I have put that in today's slide. We'll talk about them. Okay, so workflow process automation, 16% of the weightage of the exam, which is increased by twofold. Now let's see what are the important um, points which uh, are given in the syllabus. So these were the old outlines. So again, which remains same. So you need to understand which process automation to choose. So very important part of this whole process automation syllabus is that you should understand which automation tool to pick whenever you are designing a solution. So it, should it be a workflow rule? Should it be a process builder? Or you should go for a flow. So now uh, the general scenario is uh, if there are a scenario where you can choose any any of it, you can you can pick the flow. Flows are always the uh, superior or the better um, process automation tool available in Salesforce, which should be leveraged. So we would also cover some flow capabilities. What are the things, how to design flow in a bit of while now. So flows are the uh, super powerful tools. And then also there is a approval process, which are totally uh, different uh, kind of capability, which is required for whenever you want to do some approval processes and those things. Earlier in the syllabus, there was lead and case automation tool. So these are out of the box automation tool built on the platform, which you can just leverage. So these now have been moved to other section, but they are still part of the exam. So I would cover them today and standard automation like big deal alerts, dashboard notifications are there, but they I, I didn't found them in the any other uh, uh, any other overview topic. So I have not covered them in today's session, but these are good to know points like there we won't be any question, but you still should know these kind of these are old automation tools which were there in Salesforce. <clears throat> okay, so starting with the first uh, uh, first automation tool, which was the oldest uh, automation tool when Salesforce started, which is workflow rules. So workflow rules are really a uh, small, compact, and uh, uh, very uh, tool uh, helpful tool whenever you want to do any automation, any business logic to be run. So workflow rules have these uh, uh, majorly three uh, items. One is the evaluation criteria, then rule criteria, and then the actions which need to be performed. So evaluation criteria is basically determines when you should uh, check that you need to run this uh, automation. So evaluation criteria can be created, created and edited. So when so if you set to create it, it would only run when the workflow rule is created the first time. It would only check at that point in time if the conditions are met, it will run the actions. Whereas for a created and edited, there are two options. 
every time it is edited and the second option is if it is edited to meet the criteria then only it will run so we'll cover that also how it works because it's uh, these these two uh, are very tricky but these are uh, part of all the different automation tools what we have so we'll cover them as well and then coming to actions there are four actions which can be done in workflow uh, one is field update email alert task and outbound message so these four uh, actions can be done in um, uh, workflow rules you can remember them by feto feto uh, for and as an acronym for learning these and then you can also have these actions done on a time trigger basically you need to do them after a subsequent period of time then you can set time triggers that uh, these action would evaluate after a particular uh, related time so it would not run immediately but they would run after a related time let's look into the evaluation criteria number uh, three which is the edited and subsequently meet the criteria so this uh, option is available in all the process automation tools so we have workflows we have process builder and we also have flows in workflow it is available as the third option when you start creating a workflow it's also available in um, process builders in the advanced section so if you expand the advanced section you would see uh, this yes checkbox so if you check this checkbox the process builder will execute that only uh, when uh, the criteria is subsequently met and not every time so if you uh, check this checkbox yes and also that similar thing is there in flows so when to execute outcome section if you select that it is uh, uh, triggered the flow to update to meet the condition requirement so these three are available on uh, uh, all the three options now uh, out of these three uh, just an uh, information so that uh, you are aware the workflows and process builders are going to go away uh, sooner this was an announcement in the dreamforce which we had on 21st of september so in spring 22 we'll get an uh, migration tool where we will be able to migrate the existing workflows into flow and in summer 22 we'll get a tool from salesforce to migrate all the process builders into flow and with winter 23 uh, salesforce would uh, stop uh, creating all the uh, new workflows and process builder and you could only be able to create flows so flows are going to be the future for any automation so this is just an uh, uh, <clears throat> safe harbor this is not something confirmed yet this was just an announcement in dreamforce and uh, that's why i've just put the forward looking statement slide in the beginning as well this is just for information now we'll see this uh, uh, created and subsequently meet criteria how does it works this would be you won't get a specific question about this in the exam but this is good to understand how it basically works so let's say we have a record which uh, has a criteria that quantity if greater than or equal to 1000 we want to execute the actions now we started with uh, creating a record with 800 as a quantity so this time uh, the conditions were not met so this didn't meet the condition so it will not fire uh, fair enough then you edited it to make uh, 900 so <clears throat> now uh, with this the conditions are still not met it will fire then you updated it to make it 1000 now the condition is met and it will fire now if you are modifying the record again and making it let's say 1200 so the conditions are met at this point but uh, the conditions were meeting earlier as well so you didn't subsequently change anything that it made the record meet the criteria so if it was not meeting earlier like it was 900 which was not meeting and you made an edit <clears throat> which eventually uh, set the criteria to true that's why at this point the actions would be triggered uh, similarly if we see another example uh, where we initially started creating a record with uh, 1000 so the record get uh, conditions get met and it fires the uh, fires the actions now you edit it again so you edited something else you didn't edit it the quantity but you did an edit on it uh, let's say you change the status of the record so at this point the criteria is still met but the action will not fire because uh, you haven't changed anything to meet the criteria so criteria is quantity greater than 1000 so it still remains that and it was meeting earlier and you didn't did any edit to make the criteria meet which was not meeting before so this time it will not run now let's say you edit it again make it 900 so now it is not meeting the criteria anymore so uh, not meeting the criteria and no actions will be fired but then if you edit it to make it 1200 the actions will fire again 
because previously the criteria was not meeting and then you edited it subsequently to meet the criteria so uh, it would run again so in this scenario the action would fire twice for this record but it can only run once as well depending on the situation how you are editing the records so the uh, point to capture is uh, if it was not meeting earlier and then you made a edit which was something where in the change of the fields which are in the question so then it will fire so these are the two points where you see the criteria was met but still actions were not fire because it was not subsequently meeting the criteria so these are the special scenarios in which it will not fire whereas if it the evaluation criteria was set as uh, created and every time edited then it would have run on these two instances as well and fired the actions which will not happen in the subsequently meet criteria scenario <clears throat> So this is very helpful when you are implementing a logic where you just want to focus on the uh, rule and not on the other fields like like i said so if you are changing the quantity then only you want to fire the email alert to supervisor if you are changing the status you are not worried so here the amount was thousand and here you only change the status so it has no impact on the quantity so that's why at this point we don't want to fire the uh, email unnecessarily now coming to the triggered actions or the schedules actions generally there would be some time a question around this uh, it would be a scenario based question so i would uh, try to explain how the schedule action and the time based queue works for the workflows and automation which will help you answer any question if it comes <clears throat> so now for this scenario what i'm taking again the quantity uh, greater than or equal to 1000 that's the rule criteria and the time trigger or the schedule is seven days after created so the time is always a relative time you cannot give like it would it should run on 23rd of september it is generally a relative time it can be relative to the point when the action is triggered or it can be relative to any date time field on the record so it can be created date it can be approval date any date field or uh, <clears throat> date time instance you have on the record so now take the example let's take the example we're starting and a timeline as well so here at the bottom you would see the timeline and i will take three records as an example trying to explain how does this work so on 1st of january i created one record with quantity 800 now it doesn't meets the criteria so nothing happens we are good 2nd of jan i created another record record 2 with quantity 1000 uh, criteria is being met now this satisfies the criteria so what will happen we would get a record in the time based queue uh, that for the record two, I should trigger the action. Let's assume for now we are sending an email as an action. So on uh, for record two, send an email on 9th of January, which is seven days after the record was created. So record was created on 2nd Jan. We want to send an email on 9th of Jan. So this goes in the queue, sitting there waiting for 9th of Jan to come for this email to go. Now, meanwhile, I created one more record, record three on 3rd of Jan, which also meets the criteria. So what will happen? one more record sits in the queue that for record three i should send an email on 10th of jan and this so like this it can uh, hold the queue for various records in your system <clears throat> now uh, let's jump to 5th of jan we are modifying these records now if you modify the records uh, let's say i modified this record made 1000 made 1000 for this and i made 900 as a quantity for this third record now for first record it's now meeting the criteria earlier it was not meeting the criteria but now it is meeting the criteria so the actions would fire so we would get one more record in the queue for record number one getting fired on 8th of jan because the record was created on 1st jan even though it was modified on 5th of jan but it would be triggered on 8th jan because the schedule is seven days after created if the schedule was to say uh, seven days from the point it is triggered then it would be 5th of jan plus seven days and go on that date but currently the trigger is uh, tied to the created date that's why it's going to go on 8th of jan <clears throat> and then uh, we also edited the uh, second record kept it thousand criteria is met so nothing happens to this but for the third record we did some edit that the criteria is no more meeting but earlier it was meeting and it is sitting in the queue to go on 10th of jan so what will happen this record goes off from the queue and there would be not be any email sent for this uh, third record <clears throat> as of now as of 5th of jan there would be no record sent no email sent for record number three okay now let's go ahead 7th of jan now we also edited this 
record uh, to 900 and uh, it's also not meeting the criteria just one day before this. So what will happen? This will also go off from the queue. So the point to explain here is if you make an edit on a record before uh, before the time when this has to uh, schedule, when it is scheduled to go, it will uh, remove it from the queue and that email would not go uh, before that time. So you need to make that edit before the time. So similarly, 8th Jan, so if it was uh, uh, sitting in the queue, the mail would have gone, but on the 7th Jan itself, we edited the record so that uh, it doesn't meet the criteria now and that record R1 email notification didn't went. Now on 9th Jan for the record two, it is still sitting there and email would be triggered on 9th of Jan and it will go uh, as an email notification. So this meets the criteria on 9th Jan that it is uh, valid sitting in the queue and it will get out of the queue, but with an email sent. Now, if you come on 10th Jan and edit this record to 900, uh, no problem. The email has already gone on 9th of Jan, so that's fine. <clears throat> now, for let's say for record number three, uh, you came and edited to 1000 on 11th of Jan. Uh, so this record uh, was scheduled to go on uh, 10th of Jan, but you edited on the 5th Jan to remove it from the queue. It didn't went uh, as a notification. And on 11th Jan, you edited in such a way that it's meeting the criteria now. So what will happen? It will come in the queue because it is meeting the criteria. Now it is scheduled to go on 10th of Jan and today is 11th of Jan. So it's will, it will immediately go as an email alert. So this will now not work as a scheduled action, but it will work as an immediate action. So it will come in the queue and will be triggered and it will go as a notification. So sometimes you need to be uh, cautious how you are designing the solution. You need to understand from that point uh, if you are setting the criteria, how they will behave in different situations. So this is just an example how the time-based queue work. It keeps a hold of the items or actions which are gonna go and then they uh, once satisfy the point and they would go out from the queue with the actions being triggered from there. Now the action can be anything, field update, email alert, outbound message, all those four different actions which we talked about. And even for um, process builders and flows where there are uh, various multiple different type of actions like platform events, calling an Apex class, everything can happen in this scheduled fashion. So the scheduled actions and the evaluation criteria which is subsequently met is common for all the three process automation. So I have covered them in detail. So this will be helpful in case uh, if you are doing an implementation or even if you get a scenario based question in the exam. Okay, now coming to general talk of the process builder, how process builder is and how it works. So process builder was launched when trying to convert the workflows into process builder initially with that thought it's still there with that point. So what you have is you have that uh, criteria, immediate action, and the schedule action. That sequence, what we saw were for workflow rules sitting there, but you have various criteria nodes. So it's, so workflow rule all, always have one rule criteria, and for that criteria, it would fire those uh, four actions out of four, whatever you define. <clears throat> but for uh, process builder, you can have multiple criteria nodes. So you can combine all the workflow rules for one object in a single process builder, and then uh, set it up for your org. So you have all these uh, navigation bar and you have the object to be defined. Then you have the whole uh, this canvas to define the whole uh, workflow where you set up different different uh, criteria and the actions to be triggered from there on. And uh, generally the best practice is to have only one automation tool per object. So if you are creating a process builder, keep one process builder for the whole object and define all the business processes in the same process builder. Uh, generally, if the question comes, it would be like one process automation type per object. So generally you would try to limit it to one automation also, but if you have a scenario where you want to go for multiple automation, but still you would recommend keeping one automation tool per object so that it's easy for you to debug, which was not possible in the workflow rules. So that's the challenge we had in workflow rules that there were a lot of workflow rules for every different conditions, you would have one workflow rule. There was no uh, place to combine all together as a unified place. So then came in process builder with all these features and the process builder also had some advanced features where you had you were able to do different actions than just those four. So earlier we just had ability to do those four actions, but now with process builder, you had ability to do 
create any record not just task record you can create record of any s object in salesforce account contact case whatever you want you can update any related records like you can update uh, parent record you can update child records whereas in workflow rules you could only update the parent records field that also in the case if it was a master detail if it was a lookup you can't do that in workflow but for process builder you can even for lookups you can update the parent record fields you can update the child record fields and from process builder you can uh, even call uh, apex you can even call another process builder so from one process builder calling another process builder for uh, some maybe a complex logic you have written in the process builder then if you want to um, call a flow so we'll come talk about flows which type of flows you can call from process builder and not but you can even call flows from there and a very important thing you can submit records for approval process so approval process when we come into it we'll talk about that as well but you can submit records for approval process from a process builder so generally there can be a question around this as well um, so you, you, it's a, it would be a scenario and then you need to choose uh, which automation tool will work. So because process builder has the capability to submit for approval process, you would go for process builder in that scenario. So even flows can do, but if you see only option like workflow process builder, then you should go for process builder because it has the ability to submit records for approval. And uh, process builder, only one thing which I uh, want to call out is it doesn't support outbound message. So you can't do outbound message like you used to do in workflow uh, in process builder, um, but now Salesforce is going to support outbound message in flows. So that's also a forward looking statement. So outbound messages will be available in flows to be used. So flows are kind of becoming the future where you could do everything in um, uh, out, in, in, in automation uh, framework. Anything you want to do, you can do with flows. <clears throat> we'll come to that why flows are very powerful. So let's go to next slide. So here we'll talk about the flow. So now we are moving into flow. We are not going in detail in process builder because we know uh, process builders are also going to go soon. Workflow is going to go soon. So wh what are the things we had in workflow process builder? We had ability to do any conditional logic and action. So you could uh, write your own flow, design a, a flow chart, some actions, criteria. So these are the criteria. When these criteria happen, you do these actions. So that way you can define, but it didn't have any user interface into it you didn't have ability to take inputs from the user and then process them based on your business logic. So you can, let's say, assume a scenario where it's a wizard, you're talking to customer, taking some inputs from the customer and then doing the uh, backend business logic and then processing that uh, based on uh, various inputs provided by the customer. So, uh, then there are quick actions. It's also a very good point. It's not mentioned somewhere in the exam, but uh, you should know about it. Might be there a question around this as well. So quick actions are generally uh, buttons. So you create a button with a quick action in it. Um, you can define a layout. Basically, when you are saying you're creating an account record, you can create a quick action to create an account, and then you can give a different layout. So it would have only minimal fields, like four fields you want. The whole account record might have 100 fields on it, but you want to give user an intuitive way. You just give four fields for the user to enter while creating a record. And also in that uh, action, you can pre-populate the things that this account will be of this record type. Uh, these are the values, predefined values of a pick list or status. And then uh, user only enters one field. Rest all are already pre-populated and user saves it. And it's a quick, uh, ability for user to enter the details of the record so that kind of um, automation can be done with quick actions but it doesn't give you ability to write any conditional logic there so it just gives you user interface now comes the flow which is giving you ability for taking input from user it's giving user interface as well as it is giving you ability to do uh, any conditional logics if else for loops everything you can do almost everything what you can do in a code in flow but it's a low code tool you don't need to write any code you don't need to have uh, knowledge of um, programming you can just uh, drag and drop things on a canvas and build your own uh, business process there so these three are the low code tools and flows are that's why very uh, powerful tool to implement any business logic with uh, without writing any code whereas we have still in salesforce pro code tools which are where you can uh, write a code 
and they give you power to do anything you want lightning components with the uh, uh, lightning web components as open source web components you can build uh, very dynamic looking websites whatever uh, custom user interface with more intuitive and fluid user interface you can do what you want uh, in the pro code but you have some limitations on the flow still on the user interface it would be not that um, pro uh, intuitive that you can design all the different animations and those kind of things but yeah you can do some inputs and those things in the flow as well and then the apex triggers are just the automation tool for backend processing so if you want to uh, do any uh, backend automation which are really complex where you don't want to go into flows because you can do all those things in the flow but um, the maintenance and the uh, cost of keeping that flow it would be higher than keeping that into an apex trigger if you have a team who has developer uh, development experience working on apex uh, so there would be some scenarios which would be better off going apex triggers than writing a flow <clears throat> so these are the various automation tools and today we're gonna focus on flows let's go into the flow so flows are really um this is a, a, a old slide which i when i talked about flows maybe last year i did a session i it's a slide from there i have kept this as a underrated super powerful tool but now uh, nowadays it's not underrated anymore it is being promoted or uh, being launched as a rebrand it has a really good uh, uh, user interface than compared to earlier when in the flow builder where it was very it was called visual flows earlier it didn't have that kind of uh, uh, connectors and uh, auto layout and those kind of modes earlier <clears throat> which now it has and it's really uh, easy to use tool so it gives you a ability to generate a user interface and uh, it gives you ability to write your own uh, process flowchart if else for loop all those conditions you can schedule them to run on a specific time and then you can have triggered actions like when a record dml happens when it is updated deleted uh, all those different actions you can trigger the uh, flows from there and then you can write the logic which should happen after that uh, uh, dml or the record change dml is a data manipulation language so whenever you do any uh, change on the record it uh, basically change uh, record in the database and then you run these actions so moving next to different types of flows we have uh, these different uh, uh, five type of flows the major one which uh, scenario where you would try to go for flow uh, straight away without thinking of any other process automation is screen flows so when you want a user interface to be designed you would go for screen flow uh, where you can uh, set up inputs from uh, take inputs from the user and then based on those inputs you define uh, what actions should happen and uh, different uh, scenarios criteria if else condition decisions and the for loops you can define that uh, and these type of flows can be invoked or called from anywhere in salesforce like you can create actions so you can create buttons and those would be flow actions you can click a button and this flow will start running you can have lightning pages you can create a page embed the flow inside that page and the flow would run whenever you open that page or that url basically you can even hard code the url somewhere uh, of the flow uh, and then you can uh, pass it on a click of the button from a record it will run that flow you can like there are endless possibilities to put the flow you can even put this in a lightning component so you have a overall big component which you are running uh, for a external experience cloud community and then you are embedding a small flow which you build inside it and it will run seamlessly there and take input from the user <clears throat> now comes the auto launch flow auto launch flow are basically where there is no trigger point available so they would be uh, like for any backend processing logic which you want which can be invoked by other backend tools like process builder so one process builder uh, you did some uh, logic there but now you want to do some more complex uh, logic which you were not able to handle in process builder now you want to call a flow which is a auto launch flow you would call that from process builder and this will uh, run in the background and do those things for you so in those scenarios where you want to get it called by some other automation tool that will be auto launch flows these are generally called from apex process builder rest apis uh, integrations basically you can call them and they will run in background and do that uh, actions they would not have any ui components in these flows then comes record trigger flow so these 
flows are also similar to auto launch flow. They would be only having the background. They would not have any screens. So all of these doesn't have uh, screens, but they would. There are different trigger points for all these four. So they uh, run on a different specific scenarios. So auto launch running from different automation tools. Record triggered running when any record change happens. So when you update a record, so you change the status of the case and then it's uh, change in the update. So on that DML, this will be uh, record triggered flow will be called. Now you have scheduled triggered flow. So you define a schedule or a particular time that every day 4 p.m. this flow should run. So you can schedule them. So these are the scheduled flows. And the last one is platform events. So these are again integration. So platform events are a tool for integrating different applications. So you have, let's say, uh, another application, Informatica, SAP, and you are integrating it with Salesforce. So what you do is uh, you would have uh, uh, platform events. Platform events are basically uh, streaming API events. So you just, these are kind of, uh, you can uh, think of them as uh, somebody broadcasting a message. So platform events are something like a radio broadcast. So somebody is broadcasting a message and you are a listener. So these uh, flows can be the uh, radio listeners who would listen to those messages. So the other application is broadcasting a message, which is a platform event, and you are a listener. Once you listen to that message, you would trigger your flow. So once you get that message from somebody, other uh, application, which you are trying to integrate with Salesforce, once something happens there, they broadcast a message, hey, I have updated the status of this invoice. And then Salesforce listens to that. And okay, so if the invoice is uh, created, I update the order status as invoiced. So that kind of thing you can do with platform event triggered flow and you integrate multiple applications. <clears throat> Looking at the flow builder. Flow builder is a canvas or a tool to create these flows. Uh, what you can see on the flow builder are the major three components. First one is the toolbox, which gives you all the different tools to create this flow. Like you have various elements, screens, actions, you have subflows. Subflows are basically to call another flow. So from a flow, you can call another flow. So that kind of thing you can do with subflow. You have logical elements, you have data elements, you can do DML operations basically. And then you have the whole canvas to design the flow chart with the various connectors and you can have uh, design them to create something. We'll, we'll see uh, uh, one in example as well. Uh, once we finish this, so and then on the top you have the buttons. These are different buttons to debug. You can run this in a debug mode and see how the values are changing. Once you go step by step, you can see how the values are changing and analyze where is the uh, problem if it is not working fine, and you can fix that element uh, where there is a problem. And then you can uh, activate or deactivate. So one flow can have multiple versions. So you keep one version as active, and then that active version will run. And generally, it is a uh, flows when deployed to production. So when you build this, you would build it in a sandbox. And once you deploy it to production, you need to activate it. So once it goes into the production in the live environment, it would be in a deactive mode. So there you need to go and manually click the activate button to activate it there. It's just a safety feature that it doesn't go active in, in the production so that it doesn't break anything immediately it goes. So you have your ample time that you go in production, make sure that nobody is now using the system. Now you make it active and then there on onwards it would start working. So this will always go deactive in a production environment and then once it's there, you can activate it. Now talking about all these building blocks. So we have these various elements which we saw, right? There are different type of elements you have uh, which would do some specific action. So these elements have very specific action for connected to them. And then in the, uh, these elements are connected with these lines which are connectors. So there would be various connectors depending on the element. So like decision element will have uh, two connectors for them. That is yes or no. So it can be true or false. So decision can be always true or false and you can name them as well when you uh, define this element like you see this uh, get record i have just expanded it similarly every element can be edited and you can define everything about this like the name of the element what are the different uh, decisions you are there yes no it can have those you can define those decisions there can be even more as well like you can define some uh, names for every criteria so if that happens it would go into that particular line. And then you can uh, 
uh, execute the next element from there. Now see get record. So get record is basically when you are trying to fetch information from system. So now once you get record, you call the get record, you need to uh, store that information in somewhere because you are getting information from the CRM system. You need to uh, keep that into uh, into a resource. So resource are basically you can think of as a container where you are trying to put everything uh, uh, stored. So once this uh, get record will run, it will try to store the first name, last name. So these are the different attributes we are trying to get. So we are querying the contact object and then we are getting the first name, last name of the contact to maybe later uh, compare that the current input what user has entered is matching with the previous one or not. So you can store them in various resources. So resources are like containers or variables in flow. It's almost like programming, but these are on the UI level. So you don't uh, think of that as a variable, which is generally in a programming term. So that's why I'm calling it a resource. Resource is something like uh, uh, some information which you collected while running the uh, element. So it can be collected anywhere. So for different uh, thing, you can have different type of resources to store different type of thing. You have different resources, like from the input screen, you would have resources like the uh, first name, last name entered as a text. You can keep them uh, uh, captured in the first screen and then use it on the decision element here that if that first uh, on the first screen what user enter matches with the uh, one which we got from uh, system <clears throat> so these are the uh, resources uh, these are the elements and these are the connectors which join them now uh, looking to resources what are the different type of resources available in flow so flow has these different type of uh, resources. So first one is the variable type. Variable type where you say it's a container which is of different uh, data types like text, record, number. So you should know whenever you are creating a flow what kind of uh, data it's going to return. So if it is a first name, last name, it's definitely a text type of field. So it would return you a string or a name in a, some uh, alphabetical values. So you would try to store it in a text. Whereas if it is a date time field, you would use a date time and so on, depending on the data, what it is. Then you also have one called Apex defined. So Apex class can also work as a data type. It's a scenario where you want to combine various uh, text number all together in a single place and use that type. It's a complex or you can say composite type of a data type which you want to use. Then you can also use Apex class defined as a data type and then you use it here. So it's for even complex flows you want. So flow give you flexibility to do what you want. And then you see different other uh, containers. So these are something you define as a uh, hard coded. So you've set them or define them initially itself when you uh, create the flow. So you can define stage. So you can define various stages of your flow. So when you're creating a wizard that it's currently on a stage number one, you are capturing inputs. Stage number two, processing or matching. Stage number three, feedback and final result. So you can define those stages and based on those stages, you can maybe change some templates, UI on the top. You can have various uh, uh, path running that currently you are on a step number one, step number two. You would have seen those wizard kind of flows. So for that, you can have stage and then you can define various pick list drop down values if you want. You can define various record choice sets. So you can query uh, 10 or 15 records and use uh, uh, those records uh, into uh, into the system. Um, <clears throat> just got an eye on a... So record is basically when you want to store the whole record. So you want to store a whole account record in a... Uh, container so that's a record so you can store a record whole account contact anything in a variable so that's a record type uh, variable and you can also define some constants you can create formulas like you can combine multiple uh, values from uh, user fields and create a formula first name combined with last name kind of full name that those kind of formulas day plus one those kind of things you can do with formula um, and then these are the three different categories of elements First one, interaction. So you have different screens for interacting with user. You have actions, which will fire um, all the different type of uh, actions you have available, like uh, fields, update, calling Apex. Like it's uh, now uh, beyond everything. You have almost everything in flows which you can do uh, and call as an actions. Then you have subflows uh, where you want to uh, maybe orchestrate the flow in a such a way that you don't uh, 
create a very large flow you keep the smaller portions which are meaningful portion in one flow and then call another flow from there on those are the subflows which are reusable maybe you can reuse them for other purposes right so that kind of scenario you would use subflows then the logical these are three logical operations assignment when you are assigning assigning uh, data from one element to another then you have decision elements uh, which would be uh, taking various actions based on uh, attributes or values of the record and the last one is the iteration which is you want to iterate over the set of records so let's say there are five account records you iterate over them and then define for which record you want to uh, fire an action or not so those kind of things you can do so it's like giving you a low code tool to programmatically uh, compared to do what you can do in a programmatic way so we'll see a flow once we finish all the automations uh, in a uh, demo environment as well but i'll just cover the last uh, uh, topic we have which is approval process so approval process is almost uh, you can say sibling of workflow rules it's same like it has all those four actions which are field update email alert task outbound message and you can fire those actions whenever some criteria is met but the additional point which adds in approval process is somebody manually going and saying approve or okay so the approval steps are basically where you want a manual intervention in the process so you have a process automation where you want these things to happen only if somebody comes and say yeah this is good so where the approval part comes in the picture where you want uh, the leader senior manager to approve some kind of automation you have or the business logic you have so that business logic is the rule criteria but you want those rule criteria to be approved or verified by your uh, business so in those scenarios the approval process comes in picture so you, it starts with a click of button so you click a button called submit for approval on a record and it fires this automation so this automation doesn't fire automatically like the, we had evaluation criteria right? created created edited so this approval process uh, doesn't have that evaluation criteria but it has a submit for approval button once that button is clicked it will fire the approval process and check for integrator if the integrator is met it will go into the approval process immediately as it goes into approval process it will fire some actions it will do some actions which are the initial submission actions so like you can uh, set the status as pending approval or something like that for the record so that everyone knows that this is in the approval process now then goes the approval steps so it can be multiple approval steps it can be one approval step whatever you define so these can be uh, multiple steps which keep going on one after another and for every step you can define some actions that you are now at step number one so you can say approved by manager once second process completes you can say approved by senior manager and so on and then at last when all the processes are complete you can also run some more actions which are the final approval actions final rejection actions and you can even have ability to recall so the a submitter who is submitting it for approval uh, at any point it feels like i have submitted it uh, wrongly i need to update some information and then do it again so it has the submitter has option to recall it back as well so once he recalls if you want to fire some action so because it was recalled you want to maybe flag it as recalled or something in some other field so you can do that as well now let's see the multiple step approval process how it works in a a uh, quick example so somebody let's say uh, you are submitting for approval the basic entry criteria is uh, amount or quantity amount greater than zero so any record which has a uh, amount so this amount can be let's say discount so you are giving discount on a uh, on a order so you are having order discount so if the order discount is greater than zero if you are giving any discount uh, it should go into the approval process uh, then if you click on submit for approval it will check uh, if the criteria what what's the approval criteria now uh, it's going into the approval process but the first approval step criteria is that it should be greater than 1k so if the discount is greater than 1000 then only it will go to approval for manager but if it doesn't goes it will immediately get approved so you submit for approval and it gets immediately approved because the amount was less than 1000 so you have set your business that okay less than 1000 is okay auto approved kind of thing you just submit for approval and it gets approved immediately and you get the final approval actions run like it will set the status to approved so till the point uh, if it is less than uh, 1000 it would approve automatically 
now if it is uh, greater than uh, 1000 it would go into the approval step number one and then uh, here you should uh, i think this sign is wrong it should be yeah greater than less than yeah less than it's fine um, so then it should be uh, approval action so here if the manager approves uh, that scenario if it is discount is greater than 1000 then uh, it would approve or it would reject so it it depends on the manager what he takes the action so now if he approves or reject it will go into the final action so if it is rejected at this point it will go for the final rejection because it was the first step and you rejected it it would get rejected now the second option is uh, manager approved it now if the value of the amount of the discount was uh, below 5000 1000 to 5000 which is uh, less than the value required for senior manager approval it will get approved immediately now if it was greater than 5000 you need to get approval from senior manager as well so it will go into a uh, second step for the senior manager <clears throat> now uh, once the senior manager uh, takes the action he can either approve or reject it so once it is approved it will have the final approval actions and if it rejected it will have the final rejection. now there could be more even complexities to it like if it is rejected it can go back to step one you can define various uh, uh, dynamic approvers as well so if you can't if you don't want to uh, keep a fixed set of person it can depend on the record um, it can go to either manager or director depending on those things so you can have dynamic approvals as well as you can have uh, various dynamic routings as well in the approval this is a very basic uh, example i try to explain generally if you understand at this point also it should be good for from the exam perspective that there are multiple approval steps and how does it goes into uh, every step because every step has a criteria and then based on that criteria it either goes to that step or gets approved uh, or go to the next step automatically you can even have scenarios like where if it doesn't meet the step one it goes to step two directly and you don't need to do step one something that kind of scenario can also be possible right so when to use what part so submit for approval as we said somebody should click the button but we talked about it previously as well that you can automate this also so now instead of keeping it manual you can have flows process builder or apex class submit the record automatically for approval so if some conditions are met you can write a process automation which will get triggered on those created edited conditions and then based on that you can submit the record for approval because maybe the users who are uh, using the system they forget uh, to forget to click that submit for approval button so now if they are updating a record on that you can call the process flows or apex and then from there you invoke this submit for approval action so once it is invoked from there it will go into the approval process as normal as somebody would have clicked the button so uh, and you can also define who all can submit the record for approval you can define if only the record creator can submit or anybody can submit so you can define that on the this initial step then on the entry criteria you can define what the criteria which should be met before it goes into the approval process if it doesn't meet those criteria it would not go in the approval process and uh, why this comes handy is because you can create multiple approval process for one object so for account object you can have five approval process and you can order them in a sequence that this is the first priority approval process should you check if it meets the criteria for uh, approval process number one it will go into that approval process but if it doesn't meet the criteria it would check for the criteria for approval process number two and if it meets the criteria for approval uh, approval rule number two it would go into that so so it's very helpful in scenarios where you have multiple approval process per object and on submitting a record it uh, system automatically determines which approval process is applicable for this record based on some uh, values of the record like if it is a international business it should go for international approval process which you have defined if it is a domestic business it should go for the second one and so on so it helps you and then also you can define various templates uh, uh, when the record is sent for approval it will send an email notification to the approvers and those things so you can define all those things also with the entry criteria on the there then once the criteria is met if the record has got into the approval you can define what to do so you can do all these field update email task all these actions uh, once the criteria is met in the initial submission and additionally you can also uh, what you have is record lock so record will get logged uh, from editing so nobody can modify till the time the record is in the approval process somebody is reviewing it so record should not be modified it gets logged only the ability you have is to determine 
who can edit the record when it is in logged phase. So when it is logged, you can define, let's say approver can modify the record if he wish to, or you can say system admins can modify the record if they want to. Um, so those kind of settings you can do, but the record will get logged as soon as it is submitted for approval. And then various approval steps flow on, different uh, goes to the manager, senior manager. You can define uh, designated approvers. We'll talk about that quickly in a next slide. And then once the request is completed, uh, it would be approved, rejected, and then all the actions which are defined, final approval actions will send, like you want to send email notifications, you want to update the status as approved, all those different scenarios can be there. And then uh, at this point, you can uh, unlock the record as well. So now the record is unlocked and you can, any anybody can then modify the records further uh, into it. Or if you want, you can keep the record locked as well. So depending on your business scenario, you can at this point, even keep the record as locked. That's up to you in the business scenario. Now we'll talk about the additional points which we have in the approvals like you can automate the submission, the first point. So you have the various other automation tools which you can use to call these um, uh, call these uh, submit for approval action and the approval process will get triggered. Then you have the approval history related list. So you don't need to build anything. You can just straight away go to the page layout and add this related list. So it will show the history. It So like it will show the history that now the record has gone to approval number one which is manager. So you can name the approval step one as manager approval. So it will show in the related list as uh, pending manager approval and the name of the person. So it's now pending with it. So you can see the history of the record, how it has flown through, like it has approved then rejected by the senior manager, approved by the director and so on. So you can see the history uh, in, go back in time and see how, what happened to this record, why it got rejected or approved. Then you have a delegated approver. So delegated approver can be defined for every step. So let's say the approver you choose is on vacation and he is not available for approving the records. So on the approver or the person who is the one can choose a person in his user record as a delegated approver. So once the user choose his delegated approver, uh, the person who is the delegated person for that approver can also approve the records on his behalf his or her behalf. So this is something you need to again enable for that step. So let's say the manager approval, which we had in the previous, you have said the delegate approval is okay. So then once the manager is on vacation, somebody who who is the delegated person for the manager can also approve on his behalf. But for senior manager step, you haven't enabled this delegated approval setting, then the senior manager should only approve. He can't choose a delegated person for approval. So in that scenario, uh, Sec for second step, delegated approval will not work. So you can choose this delegated approval settings on every approval step and where it is allowed, where it is not allowed. Then the last, uh, th uh, second last is mass transfer approval. So mass transfer is basically like we had a uh, mass ownership transfer in the data management we talk about. There is a tool where you can set the criteria, <clears throat> see for all the records and you can transfer the ownership from one person to another. Similarly, here you can transfer the approvals. So you can transfer the approvals to one from one person to another person. If it is sitting with one person, you want to uh, send it to other person. Let, let's say that person left the company. Now somebody else has taken up that role. You want to transfer all the records which are sitting with the previous person to the new person. You can do that with mass transfer approvals. And the last one is email approvals. It's a handy tool for the approvers where they don't need to go into Salesforce. They can approve or reject right from the inbox when they get the approver email. When they get the email, they just say yes, no, or approve, reject, and it happens. These are the, some additional things about approval process. Uh, let's go next. So now uh, I leave you all with the trailhead. You can go explore all the various uh, trailhead modules that are on the um, uh, on the various process automation you have. So you have one for flows, which is dedicated for flows. It will be covering various items, how you can do in the flow. Then you have a whole trail which has four modules in it for the flow. It will also do some debugging um, uh, debugging trails for the flow. That is also very good. You can uh, learn process builder quickly. It's a very short and quick module to just get overview of process builder. And then there is one for approval process to build a discount approval process uh, project. It's a project kind of thing. It will guide you uh, throughout the process to create this approval process. It's very straightforward to do. And some of these are also a starting point for a 
a process automation specialist uh, super badge so you can attempt the super badge as well it will add you a lot into the learning of process automation and i would recommend everyone to do this uh, to make themselves strong in the process automation area <clears throat> so before i jump into the various standard automation we have like um, i see there is two minutes i have but i will try to quickly uh, talk about uh, just show you a flow in uh, in a, in a Salesforce screen. So I'm just quickly opening one flow and just I will run you through this sample flow and show you how it basically looks like and how you configure these things. So you see always this flow will have a, a start element. So this is start screen where you uh, define the beginning of the flow. And then from there you can configure these uh, start conditions as well. And then you have the different elements. So this flow is basically uh, to create a case. Now you are, uh, let me run this as well. Okay, so when you run, I'll just show you first in the UI how it looks like. So this is a create case uh, flow, which we were seeing. It's giving me a, on the top a call script. So this is an agent maybe talking to uh, the customer and he's calling for some issue with the product. So it's giving a call script as well. So the user have ability to copy this quickly and paste in the chat window where he's maybe doing a chat with the customer. So you can do use this kind of call scripts as well in the flow. These are handy components and it's populating everything for the user. So these are dynamic. So if this uh, flow would be run by uh, somebody else based on the user who is logged in, this will change. So you can define all these things in the flow and then take it. And then if I, uh, I enter something, On the next screen, you can see uh, we are also again modifying the call script based on the person who entered. So now it's giving the next call script for the agent to talk to. So thanks Trailblazer, can you provide me with the email address and phone number? So you can just copy this and send it back to the customer. So now the agent is improving the productivity. So now agent don't need to type everything and agent would not have any uh, effort to do all this, he would be able to quickly respond to the customer and the time to solve the problem would increase. So this, this kind of automation uh, Salesforce provides uh, when you uh, do this. Now let's quickly uh, look that into the uh, flow builder, how it is configured. So the second it would take the email address, phone number, and then maybe it will check uh, existing, uh, existing case. If it is there, it will try to reuse that and if it is not there it would create a new case for uh, uh, for that particular uh, customer okay so so we are so you see there are stages so these stages are on the top you see what are, what we were seeing as a different stages so i'll keep them side by side so you see the customer confirming customers so these are the different stages we are at the point and you can define that in the flow as a stages then you take the input from the customer so you are having the call script on the top then you have first name, last name, you're taking this input. So you define this user interface with all the resources connected to the uh, these elements. So you have first name and then these are the uh, component visibility, when to show, when to not show. All these things you can define here. Then you take uh, additional second details. So these are the email details you take and then you check for the existing records. So now this is a get record lookup. So it will query the system. Now it is querying the contact record basically looking for the existing customer. So you are checking based on first name, last name, phone number, all these in the different conditions. So you are checking the first name, last name, and any of the other things getting matched with the phone, email, assistant, phone number, everything. And then once you get the data, you make a decision that does you does the contact exist? So if the contact exists, what to do? So these are the outcomes. So contact not found or default outcome, which is contact found. So so here default outcome is contact found so contact found then you can rename this as well so like uh, the, you can change the default outcome to contact found to make it more uh, understandable like when you are managing the flows later point you would be uh, difficult for go inside to go inside and read all those things so if you do this you would be able to read them on the ui itself you don't need to open it so does the contact exist this decision will return you two things either found not found and then you go on from there so if it is not found you create a new record if it is found you try to link the case with this one so you are just uh, setting the stage going to this step 
and go on. So this is now you're trying to create a record. If there is some error in creating the record, you have the fault path as well. So these are the different connectors we talked about. So the get record and these DML operations, all of them will have a fault path uh, into it in the end. So if you connect the main path, and then when you click the second path, it will always have the fault path. So you can define the scenarios where there any exception occurs. So if the record creation fails, then you want to have a fallback scenario to do. So then you can go into this. Now, <clears throat> create a case. Now go into the assignment. So now here you can set the assignment and then when, while you are creating the case here. So here you can define the contact ID. So here you have the contact ID picked up uh, either with the one which you created newly or you can have the contact ID which you fetched from. So these are the resources in which you are storing. So you see the contact ID, CUR, current contact ID. So this is a resource or the container which we created and we are keeping that into the system, right? So we can uh, use that and uh, manage all these things. And these all resources which are being leveraged on this whole flow sits here. So this manager is the place where you can see all the various uh, uh, resources you have. So these are different components. These are the various uh, resources like the variable you see, the current contact 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 id so you can reference them in your uh, screen like you see the first name so we created a formula for this and this was coming up in the template in the beginning so here we had the name come up in the call script uh, customer name template so if you see the customer name template so the first num yeah so you see hello this is user first name formula. So it, this will dynamically bring the name of the user who is logged in into the system. So initially when I ran this flow, it came, hello, this is Nishant. Can you please provide your first and last name? So this, how, this is how you customize and make the whole flow dynamic. Okay, so I'll not go more details into this. You can go through, uh, do trail heads and then come back to me if you have any questions uh, posted on Twitter, Facebook, or write me an email on the Trailblazer community email address you have. So these are the automation case and lead. So these are the case lead automation tools which are there out of the box. You should know about them. Uh, they are moved into other, another topic from the process flow module, but they're part of the exam. So you have ability to create lead and case from a website. So you can on a website create a form and once the user enters some details, it would create case and lead. So web to case and web to lead are the ability to do that. Then you have email to case. So if somebody sends an email to a support email like uh, support at the rate uh, xyzcompany.com, then it would create a case record in your system. So that that is called email to case. So these are the ways you can automate uh, creation of uh, cases and leads in your system. Uh, there is no web to lead, uh, sorry, yeah, email to lead, only email to case. Web to lead, web to case are there, but there is no uh, email to lead. Then once these records are created, you want to assign them to uh, agents or the responsible person who would work on it. So you can create uh, assignment rules. So those assignment rules can find uh, a correct routing rule. So you can route them to various queues or users. So for the lead assignment rule, basically they would assign the lead to the lead queue or user. Uh, for the case assignment rule, they would assign it to a case queue or a user. And you can only have uh, one active assignment rule per object. And then you can, in that rule, you can define various criteria definitely inside it, but there would be one rule in which you will define all the different uh, criteria and the condition for different leads uh, queues. And then once the lead is assigned or being created, you also went, want to uh, notify uh, the end user or the cust uh, customer that your case is with us now, don't worry. So you send general thank you email, thank you for submitting your case, we are working on it and then we'll respond you back after two working days and those things. So that is generally done by auto response rule. So you have those things called auto response rule, which will send out an automated response back to the customer who created this email. Right, uh, and then the assignment rule will submit them to a, a queue, a specific queue or a user which you define in the rule. Then on the case, it's only specific to case, you have um, escalation rules. So escalation rules are basically to escalate uh, records to a uh, higher up in the queue. So you have level of queues, so tier one support, tier two support. So you can define various entry criteria, uh, like for if the record type is product support and if the escalation, uh, age is four hours. So if it goes beyond four hours sitting in this queue, we want to escalate it to the next level. 
so it goes to the tier 2 support queue after 4 hours automatically so that's the escalation rule you can define and it will get escalated to uh, tier 2 support queue and also you can add some notification that it will send an email notification to the user uh, after the escalation and there are some more additional settings into it like uh, early triggers i'll just quickly talk about them as well and you can read more on this in the trailed live sessions or you can check out uh, previous recordings of mine where i have talked these topic as well um, early triggers basically so these uh, this setting is you need to be just need to enable a checkbox in the escalation rule so what it does is it uh, helps you save the sla so if you say if we have a sla for 1 hour so if the case is not responded within 1 hour it should be escalated <clears throat> now assume a record is created on uh, 12:05 12 hour 5 minutes then at the 12th hour it would never be escalated because it's not 1 hour now and then 12:15 so salesforce evaluates the records in every 15 minutes interval so it will not go uh, escalated until it is 1:05 uh, so it will get escalated at 1:15 uh, so now Uh, the record gets escalated at 1:15. It was created at uh, 12:05. So ideally, one hour uh, window happens at 1:05, but it is getting delayed by 10 minutes, and the SLA is getting breached because uh, it was not escalated within the one hour window uh, timeline which you have. So to overcome these kind of problems, you have early trigger settings. So if you enable early trigger setting, it will uh, trigger on the previous uh, check instance. So on the one One o'clock itself, this will get escalated because uh, Salesforce would know that on the next instance, it's going to meet the criteria and would get escalated. So Salesforce would trigger the escalation early on the previous timeline. So, so this is just a helpful feature to uh, resolve any SLA level problems if you have when you are implementing a solution. <clears throat> okay, so with this we come to uh, last portion of our uh, session. Uh, we'll talk about some exam tips. and uh, some resources then we take some qna so in exam you have uh, various questions with multiple answers so that those questions are really very important you should uh, uh, answer them very carefully because there would be uh, not one answer right there would be multiple answers and there generally those answer would be a sequence of answers like if you do those two things in a sequence it makes it a right answer it's not like about uh, uh, both are the right answer or uh you have uh, both uh, to be done or something like that so you need to choose in that way that if you do those two things then it would make uh, the whole solution perfect solution and it would work fine and generally uh, if there are more than one right answer you need to always pick the best answer salesforce tries to look for the best answer when you say if there is a question which gives you option to do that with flow workflow rule and process builder let's say it give it's it giving you all the three options there and the action which you need to do is email alert so email alert can be done by all three and uh, you want to implement that scenario so what you would choose in that point if it is let's say only one answer to be selected so at that time you would choose flow because flows is the best answer to go for in this point for automation similarly for anywhere else also in any other aspect you should always choose the best answer and then go for that and choose the right combinations so if there are multiple answers uh, select those which make sense together there could be two right answers but they might not match when they done both done together if there is an answer which both done together makes a valid solution to a problem choose that as the answer next is the review flag so you can set a flag Uh, for any question which you feel uh, not confident about and you want to uh, revisit that later and uh, answer that uh, once you are confirmed so do that okay read all the details of the question answer so the, mostly the answer would be there in the question itself there would be minute details in the question or like you would have some keywords in the question i would say which you find out you would understand what's the right answer so you should read the question in detail to catch those keywords so there would be some keywords in the question which will guide you through the right answer and there would be sometimes not or those kind of words which will negate the whole answer and you need to choose the different set of answers in that then uh, comes time per question so generally approximately you would have 95 seconds for a uh, question but i would say keep it within a minute so try to solve a question in a minute 
if it takes more time uh, go to next question and then come back later uh, when you have more time to analyze that way you will be able to clear off the uh, quick questions easily and then tackle these questions which require more time and um, last but not least practice so you should do some hands on practice using trailhead there you would find a lot of uh, uh, quiz and the uh, exams <coughs> hands on challenges uh, to do which will uh, make you aware through the setup and the process and you would be able to answer the things better based on your uh, uh, experience now additional resources web assessor is the place where you should go and register for your exam uh, where you can sign up for it and you can uh, use the email address which you use for trailhead so that you can link it back and then the certification uh, which you do shows up on your trailhead profile as well then you have the trailhead trail mix so there are trail mix which i have created as well uh, curated for uh, admin certification preparation you can find that in the blog i have written so this is the link to the blog which you can go through which will have all the trailhead mix trail mix or you can say pathways so for a ex absolute beginner how to go for a certification exam you have the various trail mix to explore through and then learn more <clears throat> then you have trailhead live videos so there are uh, sessions on a specific topic 20 minute 15 minute topics on the trailhead you can run through them then you have certification days webinar this webinar happens every month you would have one webinar for five hours it will take you just overall through like this what we did it was just for process automation it will take you through all the different aspects of the exam and in the end, it will also give you a, a discount coupon of $70 or something on the exam, which is also helpful if you are uh, giving exam immediately. And then you have some uh, quizzes and flashcards like uh, on the uh, preparation trailhead itself. So on the trailhead, you have a flashcard uh, preparation module, which you can go through to revise and see if you are already ready. And then you have a practice test on Salesforce, which you can also use to uh, run through as a mock exam i wanted to do the mock exam as well today but i didn't i don't see a time left out i knew it would take some more time so i have uh, set up another session where we would just run a do a practice test together we will see how to solve questions basically how to attempt for a right answer uh, we'll do a session on that as well <clears throat> and the last one is chatter groups join the chatter groups where you uh, can connect with a lot of people they would help you out with uh, any problem you are facing uh, throughout your journey okay now let's quickly take some questions we have on the chat if you are watching this on youtube please post your questions as comments and i'll try to answer them as soon as possible this is an announcement from trailhead and salesforce itself which i'm iterating here so if you haven't done any certification yet and if you get your first salesforce certification between 1st of September to 30th of November, which is the timeline we are setting now. And if you are attending this session, it means you are preparing for admin certification. So you have an opportunity to win another certification voucher. So if you complete your certification within this timeline, you get another certification voucher from Salesforce, which you can use for your second certification, or you can give it away to uh, another trailblazer for him or her to get certified. So that's a really great opportunity to help the community get more certified in Salesforce. So take this opportunity and uh, try to uh, get your first Salesforce certification within this time frame. Okay, just before we wrap, um, finally talk about Dreamforce. We had a wonderful Dreamforce on 21st of uh, uh, September. You can watch out all the sessions on um, salesforce.com plus. It's a platform where you can stream in all the uh, Salesforce sessions uh, on your leisure. And then I have, uh, as I mentioned in the today's session, I would do some uh, solving a questions also, but I would not, I was not able to do because there were a lot of content to cover. So I will do another session on 10th of October to uh, solve the admin practice test, which is there on trailhead. So we will take the trailhead uh, uh, practice test uh, and then we'll try to solve it all together. So you can join that session and uh, uh, you can you can see how we solve the questions basically. So I will just publish that uh, uh, event. You can go to the bit.ly LKSF devs after the session and you can sign up for this upcoming session on 10th. Uh, that's all for today. Thank you very much everyone for joining. Hope you have a great day ahead. If you like the content, please hit the like button. 
and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell icon to get notified with all the upcoming videos and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you.